On the time scale of 24 hours, one of the, the huge mistakes that we all make, and I'm, I've said this many times, so if people have heard me say this before, forgive me, but it turns out it's still true. Getting too much bright light exposure from the hours of 10 p.m. until 4 a.m., unless you have to work shift work, which is a unique case, that bright light exposure between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., even if you adjust the colors of the lights, you still need to get everything really, really dim because it actually blocks the release of dopamine through a pathway that involves a structure called the habenula. The habenula was a kind of cryptic structure in the brain for a long time, but now we know there's a punishment signal in the brain. You get neurochemically punished for viewing bright light at those hours. Uh, remember that that uh, movie from the 80s? It was called like The Toy or something with Richard Pryor in that movie and that the kid has everything and he's the, he's the epitome of the spoiled brat. All the toys, all the cars, all the things. Now we see this with people who actually go from rags to riches and then bathe in all their the luxuries they didn't have as a child. These are often the athletes that don't go on to perform well again. These are people that crash because of other dopamine seeking behaviors. You know, I'm not gonna call out names, but there are far too many examples of these. And I don't call out names mostly because we are all capable of this. We all would like to think that, oh, if I had all that money or if I had all that success, I would really be a good human being and I wouldn't do those things. Anyone, any human being that is immersed in these dopamine circuits too much or who gets too much pleasure without having to pursue it first and really work and, it, and actually experience pain, pleasure, ratcheting back and forth along that climb. Because it wasn't just dopamine like this for you. It was probably pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain right? They're always proportional to one another. So anyone that does that, it has a tremendously hard time accessing pleasure. They can't do that. And, and we often think about the extremes of addiction and those are really severe. But we also have to think about the more subtle forms of something we really love, but indulging in it just a little too often so that it no longer has that edge. You know, there have been really good studies of people who jump out of airplanes with parachutes. You know, I, I'm sure it's a lot of fun. It looks like a thrill, but people who do it over and over and over again, often die doing other things. They often become drug addicts. There are a lot of examples of this. I mean, you can get addicted to anything. The key is to regulate that behavior. So you ask, what should people do? Well, certainly I'm trying this now and I have some good examples. Some young people I know and work with are taking breaks from not just social media, but no cell phone whatsoever. I'm actually trying a, an odd experiment, which is for the first hour of every day, no phone. And so many times throughout the day, but I try and get 25 a day where I actively refrain from doing something that I impulsively want to do. Could be looking at my phone, but it could even be something trivial. Like I wanna to walk to the kitchen and get a glass of water. So I'm actively engaging in denial, in action-based denial. So restricting my behavior in some way as a way of keeping these dopamine circuits tuned up. Also not looking at my phone first thing in the morning for an hour because Knowing what we now know about the second phase of sleep and REM sleep being more predominant, the second wave of sleep and the fact that you're working through a lot of emotional and logistical contingencies, you're reshaping your brain in sleep. That's when neuroplasticity occurs during sleep. It's triggered in wakefulness, but it actually takes place in sleep, especially that second half of sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you are in a perfect position to what I call receive the download of all the work that your neural circuitry has been doing the night before. But if you immediately go to a sensory experience, especially a rich sensory experience of stuff scrolling by, you're actually missing the information that you processed at night. And even more importantly, that second half of the night during REM sleep is when the emotional weight of things becomes, let's say you put it on the shelf properly. Things that are important to emotionally register get put in one shelf. Things that were like the comment you got on Twitter that was triggering, doesn't seem like such a big deal after a good night's sleep. And that's because that second half of sleep is actually when you re-experience these things, but your body can't secrete adrenaline, it's kind of an internal form of therapy or even trauma therapy. And that's why people who don't get that sleep are very, you know, they're easily agitated. They feel like the world is crushing down on them. So when I wake up in the morning, I want to receive ideas that I want to learn from my learning. And if you take in new information, you are not in a position to do that. Waking up in the middle of the night from time to time to use the bathroom is, is actually quite normal. And some people are really, obsessed by the fact, oh no, I woke up and then they get triggered. But I learned this last year that the peak in our alertness is actually about 90 minutes before our natural bedtime. And a lot of people, they, you know, they reach the point in the evening where they're ready to go to sleep and then they feel all this, you know, excitement and surge of energy and they think, oh no, I'm not going to be able to fall asleep. But that's actually a natural surge that's followed by a dip. A lot of people also have the trouble of waking up in the middle of the night 
and wondering why they can't fall back asleep. And one of the solutions is to go to bed earlier because it means that your melatonin is starting to get released early in the evening. And so we all have the natural ability to push to stay up later if we really need to. This has obvious adaptive utility. But some people by, who should go to bed, should go to bed at 9 or 10 p.m., they're pushing to 11 or 12, and then their melatonin signal is starting to drop off. Now they can't fall asleep, or they're waking up at 2 or 3 in the morning and they're, they're in trouble. When you start thinking about things like growth mindset in terms of how they convert to neurochemical signatures, it leads us to this place of, okay, if it's all subjective, then you know if I just say, look, I'm going to stand up out of my chair and, and that's going to feel amazing, is that going to work? Well, no. It depends on the meaning that I attach to something. And this subjective part can be a little tricky and a little bit hard for people. So I want to try and lay it out in a concrete way so that if they want to apply this, they can. Incidentally, or not so incidentally, I should say, when you look at communities of very high performers, and I'm fortunate enough to do some consulting with some people from special forces communities and so forth, they're very good, as are you, at attaching a reward to specific behaviors in subjective ways. So growth mindset, and these dopamine rewards that we subjectively apply are not about saying, oh, you know, I had a terrible day, I performed poorly, but you know what, it's great, I just feel great anyway. It's not about that. It's not about attaching your sense of reward to the ultimate goal. It's about attaching your sense of reward to the fact that you're making action steps that are generally in the right direction. The more you can reward the effort process, the better off you are at building these kinds of neural circuits and these kind of tendencies to be able to lean into anything challenging over essentially any duration. So how does this work? Like how would somebody do this, right? Well, keeping in mind that adrenaline and epinephrine are all great for getting us into action. This is mother nature's way of chemically making us feel kind of agitated. Remember, stress was designed to agitate us, to move us away from things and toward things. But realizing that that's a, a limited resource, that eventually that same chemical is what makes you have a negative mindset, it feels painful, it's the burn in your body, it's uncomfortable. And realizing that dopamine can push back on that neurochemically, it can suppress those sensations of wanting to quit. You say, well then how do I get this dopamine to work for me before I hit a goal? Because not every day is gonna be a real win. There's some days, I mean, I know from my science career, there were days that were really hard, experiments didn't work, papers got rejected, and yet, you know, I've spent two decades or more just drilling on and drilling on, and it's been a sheer pleasure at times. But there's been, you know, some pain points along the way. So what is this process really about? And how would somebody implement these dopamine and epinephrine type neurochemical events in their own life? Well, we all know the example of like wanting to run a marathon. I've never run a marathon, but a, a nice goal to have. Let's say tomorrow morning I set my shoes near the door. Now, a lot of people have talked about this. Day one, you set your shoes near the door. Day two, you go out the door. Day three, you run around the block. Day four. But the key thing is not just to go through the actions, but when you hit each one of those self-designated milestones, the milestones that you're setting out for yourself, you have to pause for a moment and tell yourself, I'm heading in the right direction. I haven't run the marathon yet, but this is the foundation upon which I'm gonna lay another foundation upon which I'm gonna lay another foundation. And those little pulses of dopamine allow you to get that action step without the depletion that it would normally bring. Otherwise, you're it's like you're spending money. This is like replenishing this bank account that you have, and it's a neural bank account. And so dopamine is the, is the thing that you can control the dosing of. And so if you say, today it's my shoes at the door, but tomorrow it's around the block, and that's it, but that's in the direction I wanna go, what you do is you now get those two events, plus the next day, the mile long runner and so forth, without it depleting you. It actually builds this capacity to
build more reward. And this is what you've done. This is what people from Elite Special Forces can do. They know how to make small, simple, physical steps in the real world that allow them to build on these reward circuitries, but they don't get delusional about how they're doing. They know, they keep the end in mind, but they get very micro. They move the horizon in very close. And so if you can move the horizon to something you know you can complete and you reward that, you essentially are where you were before. You're just as strong, if not stronger, but you're heading in the direction you need to go. You're not depleting, you're not spending out anything. And it feels a little weird because none of us like to reward things that aren't external, but the ability to control these internal rewards. is everything. I think one of the most important findings in the last few years in neuroscience is that the molecule dopamine is associated with reward. It's more about motivation and craving. There's a really classic experiment now that people use to uh, demonstrate this. Take two rats and the rats independently, separate cages, can lever press for food or they can access food there's a little bit of dopamine that's released anytime they get some food. So we always thought that food, sex, warmth when you're cold, cool when you're too warm is triggering the release of dopamine. But someone had the good idea to deplete dopamine in one of those animals. And then what you find is that the animal without dopamine still enjoys food, still enjoys other pleasures. So dopamine's not really involved in the enjoyment of those pleasures, it's involved in motivation because if you make the animal have to move just one rat's length, believe it or not, to get to that lever, the animal with dopamine will work to go get that thing. It will work through some effort to go get the reward. Whereas the animal, or it turns out the human without much dopamine, can still experience pleasure. They can sit on their couch and cram their face with pleasure inducing calories or what have you watch pleasure inducing things on the television, but they have very little motivation to go pursue things that will deliver them pleasure. So when I say dopamine is the universal currency of everything, what I mean is it's driving the motivation to develop new currencies. When somebody can sit back and say, I'll just throw this number out. Let's say somebody has 100,000 Bitcoins. The way they can register whether or not they are in a position of wealth or not has everything to do with the, the number they see on the screen or in their Bitcoin wallet. But that number is converted into a chemical signal that has everything to do with how much you had previously. So that, so, so we could talk about the so-called reward prediction error. How good you feel with an experience has everything to do with how much you had previously. And dopamine itself is what's driving the human species to create these new technologies. And so while we think of currencies as the goal, It's actually what's really driven the forward evolution of our our species has been the desire to go seek things beyond the confines of our skin. And when I say the common currency is dopamine, what I mean is the molecule dopamine, when secreted in the brain, makes us pursue things, build things, create things, makes us want new things that we don't currently already have. And so it has a lot of dimensions to it, but rather than think about dopamine as a signal for reward, like a dopamine hit, we classically Mm -hmm. think to talk about it, It's more accurate really to think about dopamine as driving motivation and craving to go seek rewards. That's the rat experiment. And it's a way of tabulating where we are in our life. Are we doing well or are we doing poorly? And that happens on very short time scales. Like do you wake up feeling good or do you wake up feeling kind of low or on long time scales? 
if you're halfway through a long degree or you're halfway through your life, how are you doing? How do you gauge that? Well, it has everything to do with how much dopamine you were releasing in the previous days and weeks and years. So you're always comparing it and all of this is subconscious. But what's cool is that once you make these processes conscious, once you understand a little bit about how dopamine is released and how it changes our perspective and our behavior, then you can actually work with it. So it's one of the um, instances where knowledge of knowledge actually turns out to be a really useful tool.